So I am super excited to be here. Six years ago, this semester, I walked into this ministry with my firstborn son. And I had moved back to North County after five years away and was in a brand new world. I was a new mom and I had no friends. Even though I had attended North Coast for 10 years before, I had been on staff full time for six years, but five years away is a long time. And my friends had had babies and there had been transitions and people had moved away. And so I needed friends. I needed adult conversation. I needed, I don't know, to like not feel like a giant spit up. So I walked into this ministry six years ago, and I found a room full of women chatting and having conversation, and I found coffee flowing, and it was very exciting for me. <laughs> and I sat down at a table, and there was an egg dish that I did not prepare, and, there, <laughs> and it was hot, and I could eat it with my hands, and, <laughs> and they were free, and there was like a platter of cinnamon rolls, probably, which is amazing. It's like the nectar of the gods. It was waiting for me. I was super excited. I walked in expecting adult conversation and camaraderie and friendship, and I was hungry for it. But what I remember from that day is sitting across from women with their makeup and hair done, and mine wasn't. I had barely gotten out the door. I was still figuring out how to get my kid ready. I was wearing some sort of like maternity nursing concoction situation. Um, <laughs> not feeling my best. And I was sitting across from women with their makeup and hair done. Wearing stylish clothes in bodies that were smaller than mine postpartum. And it just reminded me of my postpartum pounds. I remember how fat and ugly I felt. And how I just quietly nursed my son that day. I longed for connection, but the comparison that I experienced stifled that. And the thing is, those women never really got to know me. And it wasn't their fault. I'm sure they were very nice. I'm sure they came here for conversation and wanting to make new friends. I'm sure that they were eager to include me as a new mom in, in their circle at their table. But I never really showed up. I came almost every week. But I was never really there. I was too preoccupied with my insecurities and how I felt about how I looked in this new body that I couldn't really be myself. And it wasn't the first time I've ever felt that way. And let's be honest, it's been six years. It wasn't the last time I felt that way. I'm here today to talk to you about body image And it's my hope that we can tease out some lies that we all have been fed somewhere along the way, that we can sink into God's word and we can leave here on the road to freedom. But I'm not naive. This is a journey. We can't solve this in one morning. We can't unravel everything that's going on in here in just a short conversation. And body image is tricky. There's a wide spectrum. With a group this size, it's likely that one or two of you have struggled with anorexia. It's also likely that two or three of you have struggled with bulimia. And not just in your teen years as adult women. These are serious conditions that require mental and medical attention, and I, I hope that this talk, if that's you, it encourages you to get the assistance you need to continue to seek treatment, but I'm not that. <laughs> I'm not a medical or mental health professional. I'm just here to talk to us about where most of us live. 
see, there's a place that we live, and then there's God's intention. Where most of us live is with a low simmering dissatisfaction and distraction, right? And it's culturally acceptable to not really like what you see in the mirror. You know, Dove did a study and found that 91% of adult women are unhappy with their appearance. 91%. And the other 9%, I don't know, they're probably lying. <laughs> Brown University did a study and found that body image is a widespread preoccupation. In a study of college students, 75% of normal weight women stated that they thought about their weight or appearance all the time or frequently. What strikes me about that, 75% is high. And these are college-age women, which, correct me, most of us are like, I wish I looked like I did when I was in college. <laughs> and they're normal weight college-age women. And they're still thinking about their appearance all the time or frequently. That's a lot of mental and emotional energy spent on how we look. One in three teenagers will withdraw from classroom debate because they don't want to be looked at. That's a lot of young girls not raising their hand and not participating because they don't want to draw attention to their looks. And we can tell ourselves that this is a teen problem and this is a young adult problem, but I know real women who will not step up to do announcements because they don't want to be looked at, who will not step up to lead a Bible study because they don't want everyone to look at them, who will not speak out in a Bible study because they're uncomfortable with their bodies. We are not showing up to our lives. We all know that body image is painful. We feel it. We hate it. We don't like waking up and looking at ourselves in the mirror and saying the same hurtful things to ourselves all the time. Things that we would never say to someone else. But I think what we don't often realize is that it's paralyzing us. See, I thought for a long time that if I didn't say any of these things going on in my head out loud in front of my kids, that at least, that at least I wasn't passing it on. And if I didn't step on a scale all the time in front of my daughters, then at least they wouldn't see what I was preoccupied with. And that's important to moms. We don't want to pass this on to the next generation. I'll just keep it inside here. Because nobody's getting hurt if I'm keeping my self-criticism to myself. But that's not true. We're not showing up. We're not showing up because we keep thinking about the list of things that's wrong with us. And it's sort of a weird thing for me to be talking to you about body image because, like in person, because you guys are looking at what I'm talking about, right? Like, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, you are looking at the thing that I have feelings about, my physical body. So I want you all to understand I'm not delusional, and the things that I see that are facts about my person, which is I'm short, and I have short legs, this, it's fine. I do. Like, <laughs> I always have to look for the short jeans. I am short. I have short legs. This comes in very handy in coach when I'm flying, because I have all the leg room I need. Husband with your long legs, that is unfortunate for you. Jesus made me to sit here for a long time, very comfortably. <laughs> I'm short. I've had bags under my eyes since my 20s, which is even more unfortunate because I hadn't even had kids yet. And they got just like deeper and darker. I started going gray a few years ago, like before even my mid-30s. So I don't know. Who knows what's going to happen in my 40s, guys? Might be like a silver fox. That's what we'll call it. I have a lot of, like, situation going on in this area. Started 
went in around 12. <laughs> it's like where puberty hit. I just woke up and it was like, bow. I'm, I'm fat. I'm overweight. I have been. I've struggled with it for a long time. And that's an uncomfortable sentence for you guys to hear. Because what happens is we can't say facts about ourselves. These aren't just facts. They're worth statements. As women, when we say these facts, there's minuses in our column of physical attractiveness. And it makes us feel uncomfortable to say them about ourselves and even hear other women say that. I can even see friends of mine that are in here when I say I'm fat being like, no, you're cute. Shh, it's fine. I know, I talked to my doctor about it. <laughs> we feel the pain of these facts. And I feel the pain when I walk into a room and I'm not young enough or thin enough, when I'm too much or too little. So I want to talk about what facts you have, what facts you have in your mind about yourself. So let's close our eyes for a minute. Start making a list of what you think about when you see, in the, when you see yourself in the mirror, when you look at a picture of yourself. When you wake up in the morning, Think about the ways that you dissect your reflection and wish away aspects of your appearance. Take stock about how much time you're thinking about those things each day. Every time that you pull up your pants or you pull down your shirt to cover something up, every time that you adjust how you sit, so that you don't have to feel a roll or a wrinkle. Every time you size up another woman and long for her features, every time you remember the way that you used to look and long to be that girl instead of the one you are today. How much time do you think you spend on these thoughts and how much energy are they pulling from you? How much pain and sadness have you experienced because of how you view yourself? How afraid are you that your children will have a negative body image or that they'll inherit it from you? More importantly, what have you not participated in fully because of this dissatisfaction and distraction? You can go ahead and open your eyes. See, that dissatisfaction and distraction is culturally acceptable. We all talk about it. Like how uncomfortable we are that we're still wearing our maternity pants or that we still look like we're pregnant or how many layers of Spanx we're going to need to wear to get into that dress for the holiday dinner. How, much we, how fast we need to go get our roots done because our grades are showing. Like we have these whole conversations all the time about fixing and improving and the things that we need to adjust to make ourselves feel better. But God intended for us to have peace and purpose. See, right now it's culturally acceptable for us to have conversations about being dissatisfied with how we look. But God never created us with that intent. Think about Eve. She was created in the image of God, okay? We don't know how old she was when she came out. Well, I mean, we do know. She was zero because that's how she was born. It was zero time. God created her and she was zero days old. But we don't know what age he created her to look like. She's an adult woman. Don't assume she was 17 and looked like Britney Spears. There's no reason to, although I take issue with the coloring sheets that my kids often get from Christian publishers, because she's looking pretty hot and tight in a lot of those things, right? You don't know that Eve was hot and tight? Do you know what I do know about Eve? She didn't have a razor. Amen? It's not in the Bible. 
But there were no razors. There was no product. There was no hair dryer. There was no tweezers, my friends. For those of us who plucked a couple of chinnies on the way in today. <laughs> she was frizzy and hairy. We don't know. We don't know what she looked like. But what we do know is that God had spent six days creating with purpose and intention. With everything in mind, a world and how it would look. With a sun and moon and stars and water and land and animals and man and woman. And he said that that creation was very good. That's you. That's me. And then, in Genesis 2, 20, we see that for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord caused Adam to fall asleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And then the Lord God made a woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And then in verse 25, Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Did it say in there somewhere about Adam was bored? Wasn't it anything fun to look at? So God brought some hot young thing for him to ogle? No. For Adam, there was no suitable helper found. Her purpose from the beginning was community, was relationship. And we know he found her attractive immediately because in the verses following, he was like, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And he's like falling over himself saying how much he liked her. And then we see that Adam and his wife were both naked and felt no shame. See, God created us with purpose and intention to be here for community. But he also created us with a sense of peace. See, there had been no fall yet. There had been no sin. Eve had no younger Eve to compare herself to. To be like, yo, I wish that I looked like two-minute old Eve instead of 20-minute old Eve. <laughs> this is the body God gave you. And she's like, this is all right. And she stood there naked. Yes, without sin, blameless, in relationship with God, but physically naked in front of her husband and the Lord and felt no shame. And when was the last time most of us were able to do that? To not be a little preoccupied when we are being intimate with our husband to not feel comfortable necessarily seeing ourselves naked. A lot of us see that freedom in our kids. Right? You guys are laughing. You know, they like run around the house, naked, naked. Like they just think it's so funny. <laughs> My kids make up songs about it. And I was like, that's fine. You can sing about it. Don't, not elsewhere. Let's not sing a naked song in Trader Joe's. <laughs> God intended for us to have that peace and purpose, to be able to stand in front of him naked and feel no shame. But then there was the fall. And all of these other things were introduced. And now we have lists in our head that we go through that are worth statements about it being wrong to look a certain way. So where did we get all of these words? Well, I'm going to go through some of our body image baggage, and we'll see where we found them out. First of all, authority figures. When we're kids, adults say things to you about how you look or how other kids look. So I have identical twin girls, and they're cuter than your kids. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what your kids look like, but there's this mathematical equation where identical twins have like a higher quotient because it's like two kids with the same face. And it like, you can tell, people in Target like boing, like they like lose a little marbles. 
when they see two little, two little blonde girls in the same little outfit with the same little face, and it's like, oh, you don't, your brain cells don't know how to, what to do with that much cute. <laughs> so that's what happens. That's why my kids are cuter than yours. Um, it's just mathematical. But they're hearing it already. Oh, look, look at her eyelashes. Look at your hair. Oh, what a pretty dress. And we remember these things. I'm sure everyone in here remembers a few of those things that were said to you about what other people saw that was beautiful in you. Or if you didn't hear those things, you felt the absence of them, even as a young child. If your sibling heard certain compliments that you did not, there's a comparison that begins there. And authority figures can even speak things into our lives where they're talking about how unfortunate it is that you've create, you know, inherited some of the uh, less desirable family traits. I'm so sad you got your dad's nose. <laughs> well, I can't give it back. Why did you say that to me for? I'm five. <laughs> That's where we start to get that list from authority figures. And then it moves on to peer commentary. Somewhere, little girls that grow up into women think that we can just talk about our bodies and complain about them and, and make reference to other people's bodies. And so now there's this culture of criticism. I don't know if you've read her book, Bossy Pants, um, but Tina Fey talks about this. It's so good, you guys. Uh, and language warning. Um, but she talks about this. She has a, a chapter on body image, and she says, when I was 13, I spent a weekend at the beach in Wildwood, New Jersey with my teenage cousins, Janet and Lori. And in the space of 36 hours, they taught me everything I know about womanhood. One afternoon, a girl walked by in a bikini, and my cousin Janet scoffed. Look at the hips on her. And I panicked. What about her hips? Were they too big or too small? What, what are my hips? I did not know hips could be a problem. I thought you were either fat or you were skinny. And this is how I found out that there are an infinite number of things that can be incorrect on a woman's body. I remember being in, like, fifth or sixth grade, and I went to school in my 579 shorts. Who remembers 579? I felt so cool. I was like, I'm wearing like big teenager clothes in my 579 shorts. And um, I, I mean, I felt pretty cool. And then I overheard some girls talking about, well, maybe I had a little too much leg to be wearing the 579 shorts I had chosen. Maybe somebody with this much thigh should rethink her short choices. We overhear these things, either said about us or other people. And now, I am a 12-year-old girl, not only concerned about my thighs, but what are all the other things I didn't know were wrong with me that other people are spotting and talking about? See, what's scary for us as moms is that it's not just what we say at home, it's what they're going to hear at school. Other girls talking about themselves, other girls talking about celebrities, other girls talking about your daughter and making her feel less than. And then the opposite sex enters the picture. I was in sixth grade also. Sixth grade was a big year for me, apparently. I also got a B cup that year. It was a lot happening. Um, it was a lot happening for Marie. I should mark that on my calendar. That might happen to my twins. Like a sixth grade year might be big in the Osborne house. We'll pray about it. Um, I had my first boyfriend. It was very serious. We held hands a couple times on the way to class. I remember the girls coming up to me and saying, oh my God. My boyfriend told me that Brian was talking about you, and he thinks that you are so cute, and I think Brian wants to be your boyfriend, and Brian is totally going to be your boyfriend. And I thought, oh, a boy thinks I'm cute? I must legitimately be cute. Stamp of approval. And that's how we start to wear it. 
whether you get that stamp of approval or not. You get asked to prom or you don't. You get dates in high school or you have to wait till your mid-20s. We start to look for the opposite sex as a stamp of approval. And guys, who was Brian? A sixth grade trombone player. <laughs> he is not the boss of whether or not I am cute or worthy. <laughs> He's moved on. He's a successful adult male. Um, <laughs> but that is where we have some of those words from some of the absence of words from guys that we wish noticed us and didn't. And some of our confidence started to come from the fact that someone paid attention and we didn't think we were worth it. And then there's cultural ideals. I mean, honestly, everything up to this point has been a cultural ideal. Our, the authority figures are, in our life are speaking cultural ideals over us. The, the people that say that my, to my girls, oh, look at your eyelashes, it's because we think that long eyelashes are a good thing. You know, the peers that talk about me and my shorts, it's because we don't think that big thighs should wear a certain type of shorts. These are all cultural ideals. But we see them continually. We see them in celebrities. We see them in clothing brands. We move from having Barbie be this ideal to all the mannequins that we see that are all wearing the exact same size, to every model that we see on the website that we're shopping from being the exact same size. We see it in the comparison of social media. And we can tell ourselves that we know people are photoshopped and blah, 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 but it does something to our brains. The fact that every image that we see is a cultural ideal of size, shape, and color on their very best day. Here's a difficult truth for you, friends. Been up here for a little while, I've been looking at all of your faces, and I know some of you personally. None of you are cute. <laughs> None of you are cute enough. There is a very small percentage of women that actually fit the cultural ideal of beauty today. And not just today, but in every single culture, in every time throughout history. Because it's been changing for a long time. Girls with thighs used to be in. They're not. I would have liked to have been in one of those paintings in the Louvre. And be like, see, look, this was a thing that people wanted to look at. There was a very sli small slice in time and place in the world where that was culturally idolized. So we have all of these things from authority figures and peers and boys and culture, and we make these lists in our mind. And, and I've we put them in these two categories, okay? There's the forever frustrating things, and there's the must improve things, okay? The forever frustrating things are stuff that you're just saddled with. You're not gonna be able to do anything about. I'm 5'4", I can't do any crunches for that. There's not a shake for that situation. I'm never gonna be able to get the long, lean jeans. So we have all of these things in our forever frustrating traits, whether it's our skin tone, our hair texture, our height, that we can't do anything about. And we just tend to remain like low-level sad about that. But then the must improve things, that's a to-do list. That's what that is. That's our New Year's resolutions. That's the stuff that goes on our birthday list. Please purchase me these new products that will help me with the things on my must improve list. They will take away my bags and give me a Photoshop finish. That's what one of the signs said at Target. I was like, Photoshop finish? That's a high, <laughs> that's a high bar there, cream. 
Calm down. So off we go searching for a diet or a shake or a fitness regimen because we feel like it's our job to apply ourselves to the must-improve traits. Another thing that Tina Fey says in her book is that if you're not hot, you're expected to work on it until you are. See, our culture reads contentment as complacency. If you're content with your body, then you're probably sort of apathetic and you're letting yourself go. We would never say this about someone's job, right? I'm content with my job, so obviously I'm going to stop working entirely and not show up ever. No, if I'm content with my body, that does not mean I'm never going to work out and I'm going to eat ho-hos all day. Contentment should breed obedience and stewardship and care for our body, not complacency. We don't need to have a list of must-improve traits. We don't need a list of things that we're going to be forever frustrated with. But you know what? We're only going to get rid of those things if we stop giving our culture the power to define physical beauty. Because it's always changing. It's all over the place. We need to stop measuring our bodies against a man-made ideal. We need to stop letting our worth or our mood rest on this physical form that is wasting away. I mean, there's a period of time when we're born and we think what we're doing is getting, like, more attractive. We're not. I'm, this is very depressing. You're born, and then you're just getting closer to death every single day. <laughs> right? My kids were born, and then they immediately started aging. But what happens is we get past our 20s, and we're like, boo, I'm aging. You've been doing it for 20 years. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. This body is wasting away, and we cannot let our happiness and our commitment to this life, the joy that we express and feel, the worth that we feel for ourselves, be based on the fact that our bodies do not fit a cultural ideal. So what are some truths that we can live, live by? First of all, my body was created on purpose, not by mistake. It was created on purpose. You often hear the verse from Psalm 139, 13 through 16. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And that's a beautiful verse. But I want to read more to you. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body, and all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. See, we know today about DNA. We know that as God knit together my twins in my womb, that he was giving them a genetic predisposition to, surprise, surprise, have blonde hair and blue eyes. That's confusing. It's because Larry, he came and dominated my gene pool, is what happened. <laughs> you did not get this body by mistake. It's not an accident. You don't look like this. It's not a mistake that you look like this. There is a God with intention and purpose that knit you together in your mother's womb and chose your DNA. He, 
He gave me my height. He gave me my skin tone. He gave me my hair color and texture. And yes, I can make decisions that will harm my body, and I can make decisions that will make it healthier and last longer, but there's no reason for me to be sad about my forever frustrating traits. Those are gifts from God that he gave to me on purpose, not by mistake. Also, my body was created to glorify God, not myself. We read in scripture that nature shouts to the glory of God, that people can look out to the oceans and to the mountains and to all of creation and see God's glory because of its vastness, because of its beauty, because of the intricacies, and that is you. If God was a painter and he had made Eve the Mona Lisa and then he just made a billion more Eves forever, we would not think him a very creative creator. But he didn't stop there. He created a new and different individual every single time. Your differences, your flaws, they shout to God's creativity and majesty and glory and power. No, you can't tan. God didn't make everybody able to tan because he wants everybody to be different. He wants to show his creativity. He's splashing colors everywhere and shapes everywhere so that we can see the beauty in differences and diversity. Our bodies were created to glorify God and the differences that we see here glorify him. And not only do they show God's glory, but we can use them for God's glory. We can care for our bodies as a tool to fulfill our God-given purpose on earth. Or we can use them to feed our vanity. We can use our bodies and shape them and mold them into an ideal so that we feel complimented, so that we feel more attractive, so that we know when we go out, people are envying us and jealous of us, so that we feel better about ourselves based on what we have done to our bodies, not what we are doing with them. Our bodies were created to show God's glory, but also to be used for his glory. Also, we were created for good works, not good looks. It says in Ephesians 2.10, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Women, we have been created to do good, not look good. See, we live in a culture that says we need to do everything. We need to be a good mom and a good cook and have a clean house and obedient children and read the Bible every day and look super cute doing it. And we read a Bible and we follow a God that says love God and love people. He didn't say anything about being stylish and skinny while you do it. There's this quote from a blogger that went viral a couple of years ago, and I want to read it to you. You don't owe prettiness to anyone. Not to your boyfriend, spouse, or partner. Not to your coworkers, Especially not to random men on the street. You don't owe it to your mother. You don't owe it to your children. You don't owe it to civilization in general. Prettiness is not a rent you pay for occupying a space marked female. We were not created to be looked at. We were created to do something. I have cellulite. I'm going to go to the beach this summer. If you don't want to look at it, look at the beach. <laughs> the ocean is here for you. What did you come here for? Also, side note, don't stare at the 20-year-old girl that's hot and tight either. She's here for the ocean also. We feel uncomfortable with ourselves because it's like, I don't, you know, I should cover it up a little bit. I don't need, nobody needs to look at that. Don't look at it. It's not my job to give you something to look at. 
It's my job to love people and love God. We may enjoy being pretty. We may enjoy being physically attractive, especially to our husbands. But it's not required of us. We can take it off of our to-do list. I had a very interesting conversation with my son uh, a while ago. I was putting makeup on in the car because it's the only place I can put on makeup because everybody is strapped in. <laughs> I don't want you to, no, don't climb on me and try and wash your hands and poop while I'm doing this. Just sit in your car seat. So I was putting on makeup in the car and he's seen me do it a ton of times and he knows like all the different things that I use or whatever. And obviously he's observing me, but I didn't really realize, you know, what he's processing. And so he says, Mom, why do you put on makeup? It's because you're not pretty enough. You want to feel more pretty? And I had to take a minute. Because why am I putting this on? Am I embarrassed to go out in public without makeup on? Do I feel like I'm letting myself go if I don't... do these things, care for myself this way? Am I covering up things that I'm ashamed of? And I don't know <laughs> if it was really true for me yet, but it's getting truer for me every day. And I said to him, I put it on because I feel like it. Because I like to because I like this green jacket and I feel like it's me. <laughs> because I, and I bought this red lipstick because I feel like it shows my personality. And sometimes I don't feel like it. And it doesn't mean I'm lazy or I hate myself or I'm going down the tubes. It just means I didn't feel like it that day. Don't let the enemy distract you or grow discontent in you. It is a very subtle, insidious trick to make us think it's no big deal to be distracted and have a dialogue going on in the back of our minds constantly when we should be connecting with people. Don't let him distract you. Don't let him grow discontent in you that could breed into a sin where we're so discontent with our bodies that we can't be grateful for them, that we can't look to God and say, thank you. Thank you for giving me this life in this body, for making me look this way. You are more than your body, my friends. This body is a temporal home, just like this world, and we're going to get a new one. I don't know what they're going to look like, but we're going to get a new one. We're upgrading at, at some point. We are not defined by our human form. We are clothed in Christ's sacrifice. That's what we are defined by. We are wholly acceptab and acceptable in God's presence because of our relationship with Jesus. That's what we are defined by. Your body is a beautiful reflection of God's creation. That is what you are defined by. Your heart and soul are washed clean of sin and made beautiful through the death and resurrection. That is what we are defined by. See, I walked into this room six years ago and I couldn't stop thinking about how my body had changed and how it wasn't what it used to be and how much work I needed to do to mold it and shape it and own it and control it so that I could somehow control the changes in my life. That if I looked like the girl I used to be, maybe I could make myself be her again. But God was doing a new thing. 
He was making me a mom, and he was transforming me through my children and changing my sense of identity, and, and maybe through the changes in my body, forcing me to realize how much identity I had found in being young and being fit and being in control of my body and what job I had, and stay-at-home motherhood stripped all of those things away and forced me to find all of that in Jesus. We can walk into this room and any room confident, not because of who we are or what people think about what they see, but because of whose we are and what he has purposed for us to do. And we can change what people see in us without products or programs. In Exodus, we see Moses coming down from Mount Sinai, carrying the stone tablets. And he wasn't aware that his face had become radiant because he had been in the presence of the Lord. I love that passage, and it inspires me. I want my face to be so radiant with my relationship with Jesus that you don't see the bags under my eyes. That you don't notice my thighs. It's not my job to be pretty. I have resigned from that position. It's my job to follow hard after God, to love him with my heart and soul and mind, to love my neighbor as myself, to do the good works that he has prepared in advance for me to do. And if that is my focus, then I can't help but be radiant. Let me pray for us. God, thank you so much, so much for this community of women. It is such an honor to be here to speak to them, to my church family, to my friends. God, I pray that anyone that is here that is imprisoned by an eating disorder, God, that you would encourage them to seek help, to seek treatment, to know that they are not alone. And God, I pray for every woman here that is carrying a painful burden of self-criticism, of self-hatred, that is carrying the words of authority figures or peers or men or our culture, that you would banish those words from her heart and mind, that you would put in the truth of your word in her heart Embed it deeply there so that when we look at ourselves in the mirror, God, we see saints. We see co-heirs with Jesus. We see women who are created for good works, not good looks. And that we know that in obedience, if we follow you, that we have a purpose greater than fitting into our pre-pregnancy genes. God, thank you so much for what you did for us on the cross, for loving us, for creating us individually different and perfect and very good in your eyes. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for having me today.